so I want to move into our discussion and so I want to bring us back again because it's the, these are the three things we definitely need to be mindful of and we need to be mindful of understanding the difference between them because I, I do have some questions about some uh, confusion about some of these things so we need to know the difference between them. We're using our contract concepts to solve business problems slash issues. And then our contract sections, that's just the setup. That's, this is the guideline we have to follow. The book may have another organization. When you go and look at chapter five of the book, they have, you know, some different names, you know, they kind of worded a little different, the sections. But these are the sections that we uh, are told that we have to work within for this course. And so we want to be mindful of our concepts first. OK, these are concepts. Now you may have one or two of these that may also be that may have names that are the same as contract sections so you can't let that confuse you okay uh, and that is why I say this class uh, you know you have to pay clear attention uh, because some of these things will get by you and I may be saying something and it may be confusing if you don't want to raise your hand I need you to, to make sure you know that you raise that question because it's not just a question that you uh, are having other people are having that question so we're going to go back to the beginning we talked about this in week one uh, we talked about these seven contract concepts I talked to you first about covenants and I uh, told you that there are two types you have your executory promise it's like a, a actual action type of a promise. Uh, at closing, owner shall sell Black Acre to buyer. Or you have yourself executing. The words themselves are the performance, like Ralph's deal. Like Ralph in Ralph's deal. Okay, by signing this, uh, uh, this uh, license agreement. It is the act of Ralph signing that license agreement that is the covenant, so to speak, the obligation that Ralph does have at this point. And then the flip side of this is a right. Once you have an obligation, the flip side of that then for the other party is going to be a right. OK. And so if the landlord shall heat the premises, then the tenant is going to have a right. The landlord has an obligation, a, a, a covenant, a promise to heat the premises. But then the tenant then now has the is on the receiving end and has the right to receive that. OK. And so we have that example here. Uh, if you're looking at Ralph LP, will grant merchandisers a license for caps and t-shirts, okay? And so this is how we use covenants to solve business problems. And so in this regard though, it is that self-executing type of a promise, okay? And so then, uh, that will create in merchandisers a right, even though it is a self-executing type of a promise. And then also you have here merchandisers then will be obligated. When you see that word obligated, then you know that that is going to be a covenant uh, that is going to be needed. 
And so merchandisers will be obligated to market and merchandise them in a certain territory, which will then create a right in Ralph LP. Okay. All right. And so then, uh, and, and as you can see, th some of these kind of go hand in hand. One uh, supports the other. You have your covenants and your rights. Then we have your representations and your warranties. Okay. And so then this is your representation, which is a statement of fact as of a particular moment in time. And it is intended at that particular moment in time to cause another person to rely on that representation. But then you also have your warranties uh, and they have just a bit of a technical difference. At some point, you know, it may be that if that representation that is made is not true, then uh, that could create some type of a lawsuit of some type, in which we call misrepresentation. And in other words, and there can be certain types, but the intentional type, in other words, is fraud. And so that is kind of a high standard in some sense, uh, some senses, because you need to be able to prove a scientor or what we call intent. But for a warranty, you need not have that level of the intent. In addition, uh, you may not also need to prove reliance as a component. It is a very easy thing to prove, as you can see in Lenny's deal. And so these are the, deposit, the uh, differences between these two. Now, these are, again, contract concepts, okay? And so what we determine is that Ralph wants a contract to reflect his reliance on the financial strength of merchandisers. And so that is going to cause us to probably need to have some type of a representation there, okay? A representation and warranty. OK, he is actually specifically asking that we make sure that we're able to prove up the fact that he relied on merchandisers representation of its financial strength. OK, and so uh, that is what we're thinking at that point is, OK, well, how are we going to solve this problem? We're going to use a contract concept and we have our little list of contract concepts our problem solvers that we use to uh, to solve these contract issues or business issues or problems so to speak okay so then we have uh, conditions as well and so I have uh, received uh, questions about these conditions. And uh, so, and let me just tell you, I'm just putting it out there. So the person asked me the question, can we go over more the difference between a condition and a covenant? And then I, I meant to, you know, get to this in, in the last class. I kind of touched on a little bit, but I meant to clear it up a little bit more. And so the person comes back and they ask me the question because that is what you have to do to help me to teach to teach the class. And I don't have any, I don't have thick skin. I mean, I have thick skin. I don't take anything personal. I, uh, I live by feedback 
in the sense of this class. Okay, so uh, you know, obviously, I want to do a good job. I'm my number one focus is not to do a good job for myself. I'm coming here every Monday to do a good job for you all. So uh, I need you to let me know uh, if there are questions so that we can clear up uh, any questions there may be. But right here, um, you can see that conditions are covenants. They're the same thing. There is no difference. Once the condition, the event, the eventuality of the condition is present, the thing that's going to fix it is a covenant to create that obligation. If, and I said to you at that point, that when you see that word if, that's going to be your clue that a condition is needed. Now, this is the thing. As I'm telling you is that Ralph's deal, that's what I said, that's what I meant when I said to you, it's laid out all clearly for you, nice and neat. It's not like that in your transactions that you're getting. It's your job now to be able to go through that and look at the facts, get a deep understanding of the client's goals. That's why I am telling you, you must, you must, you must for my purpose. Put, have your recitals. That's the only way I'm going to know that you have an understanding. When I go look at your, your recitals, the first, when I read it, it's like a once upon a time for me. I'm like, once upon a time, I'm reading your story. It's letting me know what, whether you, and so I can tell it in the recitals. And so what I'm saying to you is, I want you to, to develop that skill because once you can put it out, relevant facts in your recitals then you're going to be able then you're going to see places in that agreement when you put it on your chart you're going to see where the the problems are so i asked you when we first uh did this i obviously you're just starting it so we went over it and i wanted you to revise your uh your business issues worksheet for Ralph's and and so I am obviously I'm you know I go in and I look at some of the exercises before I come because I'm trying to see where the problems are so that I can address them when I'm here and I can kind of tell that some of us have not done that so I really want you to get in the habit of using your business issues worksheet OK, and I'm just, uh, you know, don't think that you can get around using that for this transaction that we have. It is a massive transaction. So please uh, use your business issues worksheet. But if if, in other words, on condition that the retailer notifies the manufacturer that it requires additional merchandise. OK, so. They have to notify first. Until then, the manufacturer has no obligation. If, if and only if, they notify the manufacturer, then the manufacturer shall blah, 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 whatever it is. But the only way that you can fix this problem is with a covenant an obligation okay so now the person who asked me that question if i didn't fix it this time you have my permission <laughs> to ask me again and i will come back and try again okay conditions so look at that if if when I see if, that lets me know, oh, oh, I may need a condition. It's not going to be that pretty in the ski lift. Ski lift is not going to say if. You're going to have to get an understanding, a deep understanding of that problem 
to be able to determine what the business goals of the client are. Then I am saying to you, you need to go and put them, you need to put it on your chart. If merchandisers, now see, and that is why somebody did ask me when we first did this program, if you have to, if you have to address each sentence, this sentence number two has nothing really to do with number one. So you got to be able to isolate facts. So I'm able to isolate this thing. Now I can see, okay, number one is saying they asked me blah, blah, blah. But then number two is saying if merchandisers has any unsold merchandise on hand at the time the term ends, Ralph LP will buy that merchandise at its cost. Okay. Now, you know, it's kind of like a clue when you see will, that means shall, that means an obligation. Okay? So if though, not until, if that doesn't happen, then there's no obligation. And so that eventuality has to occur before that condition has to occur before that obligation will apply. If on condition that merchandisers has any unsold merchandise on hand at the time the term ends, Ralph shall buy the merchandise at its cost. Okay? And then obviously that after that, because it's a covenant. So then it's going to create a right in merchandisers at that point. Okay. Now I, I'm going to briefly, I'm going to talk about it again, but I'm going to go ahead and address this question. Somebody asked me, but it's better placed in another place. I, I'm, I'm going to talk about it again, but it says the book has a termination clause under the terms section, under the terms section of the book. I'm thinking this person is saying, because when we talk about our contract sections, sections, there is no term section. So I'm assuming that this means section of the book, but it, so it says, is it common to put termination section as a sub as a subcategory under the sections or under the under sections or should it be a standalone section? We only when we so let's be clear. If we're talking about sections, they're only going to be one of those 10 things that I've talked to you about with those specific names. OK, now uh, you will have a section later on that we'll talk about and they will be when we start to talk about our end game. We're not we're not dealing with that now. Our end game provisions, our uh, remedies, our terminations. The, the, so we'll talk about termination in that sense at that time termination section okay but when we're talking about uh end of term that okay we're going to define the term in a specific place of the agreement okay and so anything that deals with the end of term unsold merchandise these are things that are going to be covered when we talk about our end game terminations, remedies, indemnities, those sections. We'll talk about those later. But right now, we're not really dealing with those. So I am not really dealing with those now because we really need to get our, what I call our business, our business sections. We need to get that down first. Okay. I'm going to come back to this again when we deal with our all right so and so we'll and when I show you my worksheet you'll see that I can see that that's going to be an in-game issue because when we start talking about terminations I am going to talk to you about a friendly termination event it's like when everything turns out all well and fine and dandy at the end we want to settle up 
you know, however much I owe you, you know, owe me. that's a friendly termination event. But we'll talk about that at the end later on. But when I'm looking at my chart, I have different types of issues that this could uh, re could create. And then we had talked about discretionary authority. Like uh, it, prov it gives a uh, party the uh, discretion to act in a certain instance. You will see words like may. The person may do this or they may not in this particular event. Either party may terminate this agreement at any time by sending written notice or the borrower shall not invest in any person except the borrower may invest in any wholly owned of its own subsidiary. May. And then we also have our condition to discretionary authority. And so it would not be any different than are the conditions that we talked about earlier. A condition to discretionary authority is a statement of facts that must ex exist before that party may have that discretionary authority. If there is an event of default, the bank may exercise its remedies. Or if the author does not submit her manuscript to the publisher, on or before the deadline, the publisher may accept it or it may reject it. May. And so here we see what well, we, uh, Ralph wants to the right, they want the discretionary authority, to terminate this agreement if merchandise's net worth at the end of any fiscal year during the term of the contract drops below $15 million. And so if, or on condition that merchandisers does not meet his obligation under his covenant to maintain net worth of $15 million or more at the end of any fiscal year during the term of the agreement, Ralph has the discretionary authority and may, there's a possibility that he may want to not terminate. Maybe if things going great and it's not that big of a deal, but he wants a discretionary authority to do so if he wants to. <clears throat> and then we talked about declarations, a definition, so to speak. That's how, that's how I look at them. The purchase price means $200,000. That's a declaration. Now, uh, it is just that if there is no covenant to kick it into action. And so this is an example of what you would see in your payment provisions definition. The buyer shall pay the seller the purchase price at closing. Okay, so here I can see that it may be useful to define net worth. And so these are all things that we must all be, be mindful of at all times, all three of these together. And so here in the large context, you will see later on, we will deal with termination, a termination section, remedies and indemnities, general provisions. But right now we're not dealing, that's, those are, they can be a little bit more technical. We're not dealing with those yet. But these are all of the sections that we will deal with. They may not be uh, the sections that would be enumerated 
in your text this way, this is the guideline that we have to follow, okay? All right, so you gotta look at it all together. You see what I'm saying? You, you see, these are concepts. These, these are not sections. These are business issues. These are our sections that we're gonna be dealing with. Okay, and at any given time, we may be told, okay, we need the uh, introductory provisions, definitions, business actions, uh, representations and warranties, conditions to closing. We, these are the sections that we're being told we have to have in our agreement. And so I am just saying again, you know, here's my chart, I did my chart. It's not gonna do you any good to copy my chart. You have to get in the habit, you have to develop your own skills and get your chart together. It's gonna help you uh, as we go on. All right, now another thing that I want to uh, say, and I'm gonna try to clear up the confusion on this <laughs> on my end, but Okay, back in week two, we started working with Ralph's deal, okay? And so that memo is in your text, okay? And so I wanted you to do your introductory provisions, your definitions, your, your signatures. And then this, th for this week's assignment, you were to revise those using that same memo, okay? The memo that's in your week two. I'm going to go back and put it in each one of the weeks, but I, I expected you to use that same memo because each week you're going to come and put another piece onto your, your Ralph Steele agreement. The purpose is so that you will have that to use in your drafting of your transactions. You'll have your example. So you just add on to it each week. This, we're using the same Ralph Steele. Okay. All right. So, you know, we've talked about Lenny's. We talked about Sneaky Pete. We talked about Ralph's. These are what I like to call my transaction figures. Well, let me go back. I want to answer a question right here, though. All right. Okay, so, so somebody said, I am still a little confused as to the covenant section of a contract. Are covenants a required part of every contract? Yes, but it's not a section. It's a concept. It's gonna be used in every section, I mean not every section, but many of your sections gonna have covenants because that's how we solve business problems, with covenants or with uh, representations and warranties, conditions, discretionary authority. That's how we solve business problems. In the particular sections that we have been told we have to use, we're gonna have provisions in there. And we're going to be using these concepts in the provisions, okay? So, uh, I love that question. It just has so much in it. It said, and in what section are the covenants placed? Do they come after the representation and warranty section? Are they a part of the business action section? Yes, they are. Yes, yes, yes. They could be in any one of those. And there were some other people who have that same question. So thank you. Um, so covenants, let's remember covenants. These are our concepts. These are our problem solvers, okay? Somebody, yes, sir. Could you give an example of when a covenant would be in the representations and warranty section? Now, okay, no, because the representations and warranties are going to be in the representations and warranties. 
And that's a great question. And can a covenant be in a can a can a representation make up can a covenant even be in a representation and warranty? They're different things. OK. Okay. So why? So let me ask the question first. It's yes or no. Can a covenant? That's an excellent question. I, and I'm not saying 100 percent, but should a covenant be in a representation and warranty? No. Tell me why. I'm going to give you some bonus points if you do. Because a covenant yes. is a promise yes. to do something. Yes. When? In the future. Yes. And representation and warranty is yes. a moment of time. Yes, yes, In the yes. past or currently. Yes, in the past or as of right. this moment in time. Absolutely. But don't be confused because a representation and warranty is a concept and it's a section but you should not if you see yourself putting a promise or obligation for somebody to do something in the future in the representations and warranties i do it all the time then i see it and i say whoa and then i move it to where it goes because it's a puzzle it's okay Sometimes we need to put it there to just kind of brainstorm it. But then it, it, at the final draft, you got to move it to where it goes. Okay. Excellent. Somebody asked, will the introductory provisions always be a part of Article 1? or do the definition section constitute Article 1? Definitions are not going to constitute Article 1 because they're Article 2. Period. The end. Every single time for this class. Now, you may be working at a fancy law firm and they want the definitions in the introduction. It's... I mean, this is what we're, we're just trying to we're just trying to get our minds straight for this purpose, okay? But this is not like you can never do this or that type of deal. It's a, you know, it's an agreement. The parties agree on what, you know. I'm just saying definitions as a section, okay? You are going to have definitions, declarations in other places in this agreement. That is true for the action section where we have our payment provision. We have a declaration for the definition of whatever that is, the uh, royalty payment or whatever it is, is whatever. Somebody asked, okay, are the business action sections labeled as such or is this or is the label based on the substance of the provisions? No, they're labeled as such because I, so well, I shouldn't say no, I should say yes. <laughs> they're labeled as such because of the types of provisions there are in there. And because we have been told that our section three needs to be the business action section. But in your termination provision, you may have some what we would call business provisions, a covenant or, you know, the kind of, you know, so don't don't get, you know, confused about that. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but you may have, you know, a covenant or, you know, in your remedies and indemnities or in your uh, general provisions. But because we have been told that this is how we are to organize our agreement, our agreements here, you will have certain business provisions, business provisions. Not, I'm not talking about the business act section because after we finish our actions, we always do our actions first. Then we follow that up with business provisions. You will have what we call business provisions all throughout this agreement if 
and and I'll talk to you more about it when we get there. But if they are not properly placed, like we want to have our termination provisions in a termination section. If this is a business provision that doesn't go in the termination section or it doesn't go in the remedies and indemnities or general provisions or somewhere else, I have said to you, take that and just put it in the action, the business size action section. That's what I do. I just move it to the business action. Okay, so it's a puzzle. You got to put things where they go. Are there any questions so far? Yes, ma'am. I'm not really clear what actually goes in the business action section other than like the subject matter provision, the ticket provision. Okay. Okay, so now what are those? Those go where? No, listen. See, that's why I want to, I want to, so when we do the business action section, they should call it the action business, but it's called the business action section. That's what we have to call it. But what goes first? No. Okay, what do we call that? What do we call those? Those are what? Those are action provisions. Okay. We have certain action provisions that our book talked to us about. And we talked about that last week. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more today. Okay. I'm going to go through this a little bit. Then we get to that business action section. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ring your doorbell. Okay. So today we're going to talk a little bit about Ralph. And so here is our Ralph's deal. This is what mine looks like, you know, because I have to synthesize everything, see what's what. But this is the one that is in your uh, week two, dated January 13, 2019. This is the one that I want you to be using. And it, like, remember Lenny's, Lenny's deal, I made myself, I. After I finish with my business issues worksheet, I put I like to put all of my stuff on one, you know, piece of paper. But see, this is Ralph's deal. So I'm just showing you that these are the sections we're working with right now. OK, these are our sections. Number one, defin uh, introductory two definitions, three business actions four representation warranties, five conditions, then six signatures and seven exhibits and schedules. Okay, so I know, you know, it gets redundant, but what is the first thing that we should do? The, I mean, the tippy tippy top first thing, somebody used that word, that we should do when we are working on our problems that I want you all to do. Anybody? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Issues yes. I always want you to do your business issues worksheet. Okay. And that is what we use to determine what our business issues is based on our client goals. Okay. And so that is exactly, you know, what I do. I put all of my information. I put my uh, concepts and then I put my section so that when the time comes and it's time for me to work on the definitions of the business as action, I just going to go to my, I'm going to go to my chart. See, I know, see, when I see this right here, I say, oh, section three, I don't call this section three business, I call it section three actions, subject matter performance provision, because I know that there are certain things that go in the actions part first. There are just certain things, boom, 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 that must go first in the action section of the agreement. Then everything else to me at, after that is business. We're hopefully, <laughs> you can let me know if I did. 
I want you to let me know if I didn't. Hopefully, I'm going to clear this up tonight. Hopefully. All right. So now that we've determined what business issues or problems could result from the client's goals, then what should we do? What should we think about at that point? Because we have three things that we should always be thinking about. We dealt with our business issues. So what should we be thinking about next? Yes, ma'am. What contract concept is used to resolve the issues? OK. But before that, I like to do something else. Cause I'm, because I'm, I got to do something else first. I had another hand. We only have three things. I've already dealt with my business issues. Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Okay. We have these three things that we should always be thinking about. I've already dealt with my business issues. Yes, sir. What sections? Sections. Sections. Okay. Sections. I need to be thinking about what sections now. Okay. So then I am going to go to my instructions and find out what sections I need. This is where I am saying to you now, first thing, set this thing up. Put your sections there that you're going to need. That way, when it's time, you know, I'm, when I go through and be like, oh, introductory definitions, business action, conditions to closing, representation, warranties. I'm, a, I'm, boom, I'm just going, I'm just looking. I'm not trying to take anything from anybody. I'm trying to, I, you know, if I just want to give out A's if I can, but it has to be there. We've been told these are the sections that we have to use. Okay, so that's the first thing I'm going to do. Now, some people, and this is what I did. Now, I came in here and I showed you how to do this. I'm going to try to do it again. But I specifically came in here and I showed you how to even I had some people that, that, that you got to learn how to use your your word, you know, because you're going to get, a, you know, a legal assistant or whoever. It's going to make your life so much easier in a law firm when a legal assistant or a paralegal knows that you know how to use word on your own. Because when you tell, when you ask them to do something, then they, you know, it's all kind of, sometimes it's all kind of business, you know, but well, you, we, I'm like, okay, thank you. Then they fit, when they realize you go back to your desk and type that thing up yourself, life gets real easy in the firm. So I want you all to learn how to use Word on your own. Now, I have said to you that you're, uh, you have to have one inch margins all the way around. And so that means that includes the header and your footer. I had 0.5 in some places, 0.7 here. You have to make sure you follow the instructions. So this is where you go. For some people, if you don't know how to do a header or a footer, you can just go right here on this document, double click up here in the top of the, the agreement, or uh, the top of your document, and your header uh, menu will come up and you will see right here it'll give you your margins on your header and then you want to type it in over here you know so we need a header uh, on each one of our uh, agreements and we need a footer and I've asked that you put that page number footer in this particular format at the end this is where you go up here in this uh, uh, toolbar up here at the top and then you close it. 
you can find it over here in the layout if you know and you can put it you can go here and do uh, margins and when you do your custom margin and you come to your page layout over here it'll show you you want to make sure that you are applying that to the whole document as I have asked you or I have suggested you should print your agreement before you submit it because if you don't you some of you you're gonna have headers and footers down here by themselves at the bottom of the page okay and so I have uh, I'm always trying to figure out how I can because it, it, it can be very technical so now I'm saying look here is my document map <laughs> okay there are certain things that you're gonna need now let me just say this uh, I, I uh, I'm gonna answer this question later on there are some people don't uh, these are the names the titles that you must have are the names of the sections your introduction you can call it introduction or introductory provisions your definitions your business slash action section your representations and warranties but what I don't want to see is like I can see throughout the agreement some people they'll name a provision covenants don't use contract concepts as names of your provisions covenants and rights I've seen so that that begs the question to me okay are these the only covenants or rights in this entire agreement because you're naming this covenants and rights so don't use contract concepts to name your provisions okay other than that you can name them a ham sandwich if you want to <laughs> but don't use because then if you say this is a covenant then I'm like okay so you don't have any other covenants okay so here I have my little document map here you know of the kind of things that uh, you know because these are just things that you need that you must have in certain places okay and so we're gonna when we get to that business class action section you will see and my actions go first I got to have for my actions a subject matter performance revision it has to have certain things in it I have to have a payment provision it has to have certain things in it I have to have my term I have to have my closing information and I have to have deliveries closing deliveries or deliveries that's the actions now everything below that are gonna be business sections that's all gonna come before you get to your representations and warranties okay so let's talk a little bit more about that so now that I have decided uh, I have dealt with my uh, instructions and it has informed me of my sections okay then what should I do I'm just gonna set it up I start to set it up and so in setting it up uh, what do we start with first in the agreement yes <laughs> uh, okay but it globally we start with our our introduction yes and now <laughs> Now, before I get before I get there, you get you got way ahead of me. But for the introduction, then what do we need? Preamble. Right. We need our preamble. What else? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. 
Yes, yes. So we need our preamble, our recitals, and our words of agreement. That's what we need for our introduction, okay? Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the uh, preamble. All right, so for that uh, preamble, what are we gonna need? Yes. Uh, the name of the agreement, um, the name of the party. Yes, yes, yes. So we need a preamble. In our preamble, we need our name of our agreement. We need the date. And we need the name of the parties. Okay? So these are the things that you need to be thinking about. You want it to be, you know, you don't, I mean, I'm not, you know, I, I, you know, I'm the, the problem comes with the uh, samples, but I'm, I'm just saying you don't need them, you know. If you can think about, because eventually somebody's going to ask you to do an agreement, you don't want to have to rely on a sample that does not have really anything to do with the facts of your particular case. It's going to lead you down a primrose path. Okay. And so in naming those parties, we have to do two things. We have to identify and then define. So I'm just saying, if you keep the same, I just go step by step. I, I'm, so, I'm just saying, I'm not telling you anything that I don't do every day in my everyday life. Once I have the recipe, I go by the recipe every single time. And then we have our recitals. In our recitals, this is where we first start to number, okay? From the recitals on down, we need to be numbering each and every provision. I'm still seeing definitions that don't have numbers. When you go to do your negotiations and you're talking to opposing counsel about that definition, uh, you can call it by name, but what we need to do is we need to be able to say article so-and-so, 2.3, we need to number each provision in the uh, agreement. And then we have our words of agreement, okay? Our words of agreement need to have the consideration exchanged by each party. Uh, I have seen some that says this is this, and so this contract provides for the sale of such and such but it doesn't talk about what each party's consideration is. That's not a proper words of agreement for, for my purpose. I'm trying to get you into a certain, you know, flow. I wanna see the consideration exchanged by each party there, and then your magic words. So this is everything that I'm looking for in that introduction. And so here I'm going back at all the time to my deal memo or whatever my whatever uh, materials are in my transaction because those are the facts, the facts of the problem. It can't be the date that I the wanted to be. The amount of revenue that Ralph generates through the grant of the use of the trademark is based on royalties. I'm laying the foundation now to get into the business goal. I'm just trying to get you to show me that you have a deep understanding of the business of what the business goals will be for this client.
And so each one is numbered, as you can see. Therefore, the more products sold, the more money. And so Raphael P. prioritizes maintaining the popularity of this trademark by closely monitoring the brand. It, you know, the facts, this is what the facts are telling me. I need to understand, okay, you know, why? Why is he so, you know, specific, so particular? Because he wants to maintain the popularity. Because if it's not popular, he can't make money. No, nobody would want to market and sell items with that trademark image. And so he's looking at the financial strength of a company to be able to gauge whether they would be able to uh, maintain the brand popularity. And so then now I'm going to talk about merchandisers because at some point I need to introduce them because I just can't start talking about them. So you want to introduce them. They're in the business of manufacturing and selling caps and t-shirts. So it, sometimes it may not take but a few recitals, but sometimes you may need more to build into the, the goals of the client. And so I need to talk about the financial statements because the financial statements are of great importance to the client because this is what he is using to gauge the financial strength. And he has said to me that he wants us to make sure that we prove up the fact that he has relied thereon. So I need to communicate that in the background because later on when the time comes, if it comes to be that these were falsified records or whatever the case may be, and I go to sue, the judge will be able to look at the, the contract and see what I was trying to do. It may not necessarily bind the recitals, but everybody will understand what my goal was from the beginning. The only way I'm going to understand that you know that is to have recitals in your agreement. Okay, so then you can see now I have my, uh, my consideration. Here are my recitals. I know it's, I'm not my recitals, my words of agreement. I know it's my words of agreement because it comes right before my magic words. Therefore, by signing this agreement, by signing this license agreement, Ralph is doing this. And during the license term, merchandisers share market and sell the caps and t-shirts and pay a royalty. I have what both sides consideration is, and then I have my uh, magic words here, uh, you know, you can see that usually what you'll do is you'll put that final part of your words of agreement, I mean your, uh, the second part of your words of agreement in caps or whatever, but you don't need to. I will see it, but it needs to be a separate part of the sentence. It still is a part of the words of agreement. So it's one, two, but you don't, net, you don't number this last part because it is a part of the words of agreement. It is a part of article 1.9. So it depends on the type of agreement that it is. You know, some you may need more to get, you know, the relevant issues in there, uh, the relevant facts. And then there may be some that you may need less than this, but let's not just have facts for the sake of having facts. It needs to be something that would be relevant to the uh, client's goals. Now, uh, for instance, I saw, and when you are, you know, developing those facts, they have to be true facts. So you have to be clear on whether you are drawing, when you're drawing an inference from 
something that the client is telling you. It has to be, let's not, you know, go too far off the reservation on what that means. Uh, in some respects, I may have seen, let's just say, uh, some, a fact that would we'll talk about in the stove agreement about the idea that um, that Pilar's wants to make sure that the stove works. I'm not okay. So on the one hand, I would ask, okay, let's go back and look at the facts. What you know was that specifically stated? Then you got to ask yourself, okay, let's say it was. How does that further? my client's goals to have that in the recitals. When I'm saying I'm not providing any warranty that it will work. So whether Pilar's wants to make sure it works or not, it's not a relevant fact for my client's goals. Now, uh, and, 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 and let's just say I sent it over to Pilar's attorney and they say oh I'll say something in the recitals about you know the fact that you know he wants to make sure that it, I'm be like why we don't need that I'm not providing any warranty that once you get it over there to Pilar's pizza that this stove is gonna work I'm trying to recoup some money what's my goal I'm trying to recoup as much money as possible without losing any so that means if it works, I, I don't want to have to come out of pocket if it doesn't, or if you try to sue me or whatever the case, all of those, I, when I have my client's goal, my client's goal is to recoup as much money as possible. That means he doesn't, he, he doesn't want to lose any money on the deal. Okay. And so you have to be clear and may, you may think that you know, you can draw an inference that Pilar's wants to make sure that it works, but you want to be sure that you're drawing a correct inference based on the facts. I'm be, I'm looking, I'm be like, okay, well, who said that? Where did that come from? Where are you getting that from? I'm looking at your recitals to make sure you have a deep understanding. Yes, sir. Could but there was the okay. agreement that he could. Inspection, so. Okay, he could finally here. Yeah, he can inspect it, and then at that time he could take it or leave it. Yep. So, right. So, so in in drafting it so that your client is protected, if protected from what? From the from him walking away. From, from who walking away? Oh, we don't care if he walks away because we'll find somebody else. Yeah. But but so he's putting the stove out there. If this is closing at a, a certain time frame, you got another stove coming in. Uh -huh. You got to get rid of this stove mm -hmm. first. Uh -huh. uh, are you saying that the final inspection to make sure that it would work is irrelevant? I mean, I'm not saying it's, that it's irrelevant, but I'm saying that it is secondary to the fact that he wants to make as much money as possible without losing. So if that means that you know it, you can do a final inspection if you want it, great. If you don't. I may be able to find somebody else for this particular deal. All I'm trying to do is give you an opportunity to see that, you know, it's in the same condition as it was when you first saw it, you still want it. But as you can remember from the transaction, it either party, no party needed to close this deal. And so that, that's what we're, we're focused on our client really in the recitals. We don't really care. I mean, we still have to put a provision in for this. this Eventually. Eventually, but the recitals, we really just care, we care about our clients. Right. Who cares about? Well, that's what I'm looking for for okay. my for, for my purpose. And that's what you would be doing when the partner comes to you with this client. That's what you're supposed to be doing, doing as much work as you can for your client. Keeping in mind, you are going to have to negotiate. You're going to be negotiating with another attorney. And even the recitals is up for grabs in that particular situation. But in this case... The, to me, that's zero. That's I would not move on that because I'm not providing any warranty. Once I unhook it and put it out there on once we say, OK, we're doing this. I'm going to go. I'm going to take it out there to the curb because I don't want you coming in, messing up my you know, business, trying to pull it out. I'm just going to put it right here on the curb. You come pick it up. Whatever you want to do. You good. We good. When you get it over there, if it doesn't work, 
I don't, I don't want to hear from you. I'm done with you. <laughs> my new stove is coming. I got my money and my purpose has been fulfilled at that point. And I don't want to lose any money now. Time is money, all kinds of, you know. But if you come and you, and you say, okay, you know what? I don't want it at this point. Then, you know, we both... It is what it is. It may be at that point, these are just not facts that we need to be dealing with. We just need to deal with the four corners of what we do. But at that point, maybe I might just decide, okay, I'll just trade it in or whatever. I don't know. But for this purpose, it's you come, even at the time of closing, if you don't want to, neither party has to close this particular deal. Okay. Are there any questions about that? Okay. All right. So now after those introductory provisions, then we are going to start working on our definitions. Okay. Now for the definitions, I am just telling you, I'm just trying to give you a place where you can just start, you know, you know, just run on off. And so what I'm saying is we want to define the agreement, define the parties, define the other party, and define the thing that the agreement is about, the stove or whatever it is. Then after that, I'm going to go on a scavenger hunt in my business issues worksheet. Okay, and so that's what we do. We define the agreement. So now I don't have to keep calling it license agreement all throughout. Now I call it, whenever I say in this agreement, or this agreement, we're talking about this licensing agreement. Then I define my parties, Ralph L. P. Shelmeen. Then I define my party. Because now, up until, you know, up until this point, obviously, and I'm going, you want to use the same name now, you know, that you defined it as in the preamble, you know, but now I have a clear definition on who this person is in the agreement. Yes, ma'am. How important is it for us to use shall mean versus just means, like have it be structured as a covenant versus a declaration? Well, uh, you can, you really, you can say means. Uh, because it's because it is just a declaration. I mean, this is a declaration. Okay. There is not something that anybody uh, is not an obligation that any party has, but it is, you know, this is who we're talking about. It's just a declaration. Okay. And then license shall mean. So then I, I start going throughout and I start saying, okay, once I start doing this and I start defining some things, it may, it may mean now that I, have, I may see some things that I need to define further because, and they may not be on my business issues worksheet or they may be there, you know. But sometimes you will be working on a definition and you will need to, you know, you will see, oh, okay, I haven't, I need to define that because I haven't talked about that anywhere else in the agreement. And so after I define the agreement, I define the parties, I define the thing the agreement is about, then I'm going to go into my business issues worksheet and I'm start looking for definitions. So everywhere, this is what I'm saying to you. You know, if you haven't done your worksheet, then, you know, it makes it that much harder for you. But I have my worksheet. So I go to my worksheet and I'm looking for all of my worksheets that have declaration definitions on. Because I have put my concepts on them. So I see, oh, look, Ralph Trademark image. I see, oh, licensed territory. Okay. And so then here I go into my definitions and I add those definitions in there. Okay. 
Now, so what I am going to do uh, is I am going to give you an opportunity to uh, do some extra credit on these and revise any, some of you have them, some of you don't. Uh, revise some of your uh, definitions. One of them is going to be licensed territory. I wanna see what you come up with uh, for that. Based on our facts now that we have been given. Now, somebody asked me, uh, okay, is it acceptable to define terms using outside sources? For example, uh, net sales based on an outside source. Somebody asked me this last week about using a, def a, uh, a definition from a dictionary. That's fine for you to, okay. But what you need to do is to say, okay, what is my client's goal? Because if you define it too well for like Lenny's purpose, we just need ding, dang, boom. We don't need a good and proper definition of what decent means. Uh, so you have to focus on your client Go. You go out there, you may see a outside source just to give yourself a general idea of what this thing means, then you need to tailor mm -hmm. it based on the client's goal, whatever the client's goals are. Okay, so, uh, you know, for net sales, you know, it may be that there may be some things, some production costs or something that may not be included in that. But you need to be clear that Ralph wants to make money. And Ralph is our client. So you want net sales to be as much as it can be. You don't want too many things to be deducted from the cost of manufacturing and all these things to be able to arrive at what net sales is because royalties are based off of net sales. So it's okay, but you gotta make sure that that definition that you put in there then is going to further the client's goal, okay? So here, oh, wait. Okay, oh. so so as you can see here, then I go back to my worksheet and see, I see more, okay, net worth, okay, uh, definition or declaration for net worth because over here, if merchandise is net worth at the end of any fiscal year, so then I need to define what net worth means, okay. I'm looking, I'm looking at all my Worksheets defined where I have section two. Oh, net sales. So once I do my first four, then I'm going to come in with my definitions uh, from my business issues worksheet. I may have some different things that I defined where I can see now that I need to define some words in those definitions. And so that is you know how we go about doing this and so for extra credit I'm going to ask you to provide if you are uh, so what you're going to do is you're going to do your assignment for next week then there's going to be a place in there for you to put extra credit you want to set it up this way you want to put your definitions that I'm asking for licensed territory net worth and net sales And you can, there should be a place in there uh, for you to upload that if you're interested in doing that. Now, if you're just going to put something in there, I want you to do a good job. I want you to really think about the client's goals and really develop your definitions. Go back, think about your recitals. Uh, and so you're going to put your assignment now you know, there's gonna be a place for your assignment. So what you're gonna do for your assignment is you're gonna put your sections that we've already done. You should have done your business actions added on today. Next week, I believe it may be representations and warranties. You wanna just add that to it and upload that because then it's gonna be a document that has all of your work coming forward on it. If you find that you, that there's some things, 
after we've talked that you want to revise, it would be a good opportunity for you to revise it because it is going to be for your own use uh, and edification on your uh, transactions going forward. Okay, so now we've done our definitions. I'm not saying they're complete, but this is how you start your definition section. It may be that we may need some other definitions uh, for Ralph's deal. Okay, but then now that we've done that now, uh, and that is how you work on the agreement because it, it, you, as you go along, you may see as you're going along in other provisions that you need to go back and put definitions in the definition section because they don't go, they don't, they're, they are not properly placed in another section of the uh, agreement. And so now we're going to our business last action section. Okay, and last week we talked about this. We start with our actions first. Okay, there are certain things that go in the action section. Okay, and so you can't put them in other places in the agreement. There could be some declarations that go in the action section, but because they go in the action section, I would not want to see them in your definition section because they this these are things that must go in your action section. Okay, so we start off with our subject matter performance provision. Okay, and then for the subject matter performance provision, I must see a party covenant or obligation for each one of the parties in there. It is the main covenant of the agreement. It could be a self-executing or an executory one for each for the one that is for, but you need one for each. Then immediately after that is completed, your payment provisions come next. It could either be in the form of a covenant or it could be a declaration covenant combo. Now for me, as you know, I like the declaration covenant combo. I like to define the royalty, however much it is, and then come back with a covenant. If you're gonna try to do just as a covenant, either way, it has to answer the question, pay what to whom, how, and when. Some of those are not uh, you know, I'm not seeing that on your exercises. So if you feel like you need to revise that, then please go back and revise that so that you will have a correct payment provision. That it is critical, especially for our client in this particular uh, agreement. I don't want any loosey-goosey about how you're going to pay me my royalty, Mr. Merchandisers. That's critical. Then the term of the agreement. Then information about a closing, if there is any closing. The closing date. The time. See, it doesn't, you know, I, I know the, the book does not necessarily talk about time, but it doesn't make any sense for you to tell me the date and the place and then not tell me what time. It may be that it may be a certain type of deal that we want to make sure that we have that closing early at like 10 a.m. because some things that may need to occur, escrow or whatever that may be. I need to start off early in the day. I don't need to have it at five o'clock. It's critical to have a date, time, place, and the purpose. What you know to sign the closing documents, or you know, what are we doing at closing? And then deliveries. Now, I talked to you last week about. Uh, I'm just. And I'm doing this only for your own good because what some people, they have problems when they get to the end of the agreement, they haven't even thought about exhibits, okay? So 
in all of your agreements, what I want to see it are your deliveries. They, it, you may have an agreement that may be a one-off deal. It may not have a term. You may have an agreement that uh, has a term, but it doesn't have a closing. But all of your agreements, I want to see deliveries of some type because I am trying to focus your mind on your, because in your deliveries, then you're going to say, um, you, uh, at, you know, attached here to uh, is a copy of the uh, trademark, uh, at the registered trademark. Uh, from the trademark office, it's attached as the exhibit B. When you get to exhibit B, I'm, you know, I'm, when you get to your exhibits, I'm going to expect to see that in your listing of your exhibits. But what I'm trying to get you to do is to focus your mind on client goals. The first delivery that I want to see in every situation is that document that is the most important to our client. <clears throat> it may be some type of payment certificate, certificate of payment, or it may be some type of a document that would establish financial strength. Because that's important to the client. That's what the client is, is, is counting on that. So I want you to get in the habit of having your section here, your uh, in your actions, your deliveries. That way, when you get down to your exhibits, you just don't have just a list of just stuff. That's what I see. You know, people just think that you just have to have just a list of things just for the sake of no. I want to see that thing. I mean, if you have to go, if you're saying cash, if you letting the person bring cash, I, I you know, I. But I want to see maybe a, a, a listing of the serial numbers or a copy of each bill. It's cash, you know, or I need the credit card authorization certificate to show payment. Exhibit A. I am thinking about the client's goals. What is the client? What is the tr client trying to do? What's important to the client? Those are the things that should be the makeup of, of your exhibits. So the first one though, let be exhibit A, the one that is most important to the client. Then you list your other ones as they relate to the deal. You will get you know, information in your deal or in your transaction materials that would formulate your uh, guidance on what type of exhibits you would need to have, but you want to put the most important ones that relate to your client's goals uh, first. And so I'm just going to my chart and I see my actions. I need a self-executing covenant for Ralph and over here, an executory uh, covenant for merchandisers. I'm using my chart. Oh, look, over here, standards re. Okay, this agreement will have a three year licensing. Oh, term. The term of the agreement. I need to define the start and end date of the term of the agreement. That goes in the action section. These are things that must, must, must go in the action section. Boom, boom, boom. So I start with those things first. <clears throat> and so our payment provision, the parties have agreed that with respect to each year of the terminal commercial must pay royalties of 15% of all net sales. Okay. So that's going to, that's how I know that I'm going to need a declaration, uh, a declaration and covenant combo because I need to define royalty. I'm using my chart. 
when the royalty payment shall be paid. Okay. Pay what to who, how, when. Okay. So I'm using my business issues worksheet. Is there a question? And yes, the royalties sir. will only go in that section in the payment provision when we apply it. We don't need to stick it up in our definitions. No. I would not want to see that again in your definitions because this is where it goes. And that's how we determine, uh, you know, which, because I did have a question. I had a question, uh, I believe it was last week, of how to determine what definitions uh, go in. Th these are certain definitions that go in certain places. Defining the term, I would not want to see that in the definitions because it goes in the action section, period. So we have our payment provisions. Just make sure that you are uh, you know, fulfilling all of the requisites of a proper payment provision, okay? It has two components, a statement of the amount and a promise to pay. Some will want to do it in one covenant, but it has two components. I like to do it in a declaration covenant combo. If, if you want to do it as one covenant, that's fine. Just make sure you're answering all of the questions, what to who, when, and how. And so there in my uh, business issues worksheet, I'm just making sure that I have all of my components. Yes, sir. What's the difference? How do you know that you put net sales in the definition section and royalties in the payment section? Okay, because once I say pay what to who, how, and when, Anything outside of that is a definition that goes in the definition section. Pay what to who, how, and when. Pay what? I'm going to pay the royalty. To who? To Ralph L. P. How is I'm it's going to be defined in my definitions because it's going to be in cash or whatever the definition of cash is, is going to be up in my definition section when at closing, which is defined in the action section. Only. Only. It's a puzzle, you see how it's a puzzle? So what we don't do, you know, I, now I'm just saying only, okay, like I said, you could be working for somebody who, you know, but what we don't do, it creates ambiguity when you have a definition of the same thing here and there. We just don't, we don't do that. That's just, okay. Once you define it, it's defined here. If it's something that is properly placed in the in the action section, you're defining it there. No need to define it again in the, decor in the definition section. Then here are some other things that go in our action section. Okay, the term of the agreement, closing date deliveries. So this agreement will have a three year licensing term to begin on the first day of the month after the end of this month. And we were told in our facts, let's assume that we're going to sign the agreement tomorrow. So we have to use the facts that we're given for that. Our closing and then 
closing deliveries. If there is a closing, you call it closing deliveries. If there's not a closing, you're, I still want you to put deliveries there so that you can have a place marker for the types of documents that are going to be in your exhibits. And so added on to that um, extra credit, I want to see your deliveries for Ralph's deal. But uh, I'm, I'm going to put this in the, uh, I'm going to ask, you know, the, it'll say extra credit. Please provide definitions, license, territory, network, and the business action section is going to say, please provide your deliveries. In there. Okay, so then, okay, now, okay, so we have our things. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Uh, no, you can go ahead. If you want to do it, go ahead and do them. And what I am going to ask you to do is to think about whether or not there could be any improvements on them. If you don't think there needs to be any, you can still submit. Yeah. Now we've done our actions. You see which ones are actions. So now everything else now, if it does not go, if it's not properly placed as a termination provision, general provision, uh, remedies, uh, and indemnities, then just put it right underneath your last action section. A and I will know that's your, that's the start of your business, so your business provisions in your business, your business last action section. So, I'm going to my worksheet. Ralph LP wants the right to terminate this agreement if merchandise network as at the end of any fiscal year during the term of the contract drops below $15 million. I may need to have a covenant obligating merchandisers to maintain a net worth of $15 million or more uh, at the end of each fiscal year. This is, how, this is why I'm using my, my worksheet. Otherwise, it's going to be hard to see. So I know what my action sections are. Boom, boom, boom. So I know this is probably... Even if I don't know yet where this goes, I'm going to put this in my business, right underneath my actions. It may be later on, but I'm already seeing that at the end it says, at the end, uh, may want to terminate. Words like term, terminate. That's letting me know that's probably something that's going to go in my in my termination section. So I'll go ahead and put it over there. This could be like some type of a termination. It says he wants to write. So I may need some discretionary authority. I've already determined that. So later on, when time comes, I can plug that into my when I'm looking for terminations. I know where to go. Here, merchandises is to have an obligation to use commercially reasonable efforts to market the Ralph merchandise. And so uh, that is 
a money issue, I may need some type of a covenant. Because if you're not doing everything you can, that's what this whole agreement is about. You are to pay me a royalty. How are you going to pay me the royalty if you're not going out and doing everything you can to market and sell? Okay, so I'm thinking then I'm probably going to have to have some type of a uh, covenant in the business section for that. Okay, uh, it may be, you know, over here we're talking about the parties have agreed that with respect to each to pay royalties and equal to 15% of all net sales. Well, I, I may need to have some type of a, a, a covenant maybe that would talk about uh, the accounting or when the accounting of net sales takes place, maybe. Ralph LP has a reputation lawyer, requires his license to submit samples. Okay, so I may need a covenant. See, that. so you see, this is how we figure out where our business uh, uh, sections, our business provisions go. You see that now? But the only way you're going to be able to see that is if you really go in and commit to doing a worksheet. Otherwise, you, you just won't see it. So I really want you to do that. I asked you to bring it with you to class. But I, you know, I don't want to be, you know, I, I want, I want you to do it if you want to do it. Okay. And what I'm trying to tell you is that I've been practicing law for 15 years. I use, I use the worksheet. Okay. So is now is, you know, you might as well do it now, start learning how to do it so that you can develop that skill. And it does not come easy. You see, I have to get it and I start working with it. Then once I start working with it, you think it started off like this? No, I'm developing it as I go. Because as I go, then I'm like, oh, wait, hold on. I need this or that. And so this is then what I'm looking like. I am drafting. You see, I have the end of my action section. And then I come in with my business underneath. Okay. Uh, you know, the pre-approval, unsold merchandise. All of these are things that the client has asked for. I, I didn't just make that up. It, the, he, that's what the client wanted. And so now I'm going to switch over and talk a little bit about Lenny's. I have my closing. I have my business. I just want to preview my business uh, action section, starting off with my actions. I already know I don't need to go to a book. I don't need to go anywhere. I know in my mind, I start off with my subject matter performance provision. I know I'm then coming with my payment provision. I know what I need for my subject matter uh, performance provision. I need some type of promise on both sides. I need my payment provisions. I already know I don't need to ask anybody. I always do a declaration covenant combo. I'm going to define the type of payment and then I'm going to do a covenant that explains pay what to who, how and when. Then I'm going to think about, OK, do I have a term? No, this is a one off deal. I don't have a term here. OK, so then but I did have a closing based on the facts. The facts said we had a closing. So we make up my little clue. I use my information from the uh, deal that tells me the date, the time, the place, 
uh, at which time Lenny's will deliver the head spin, the bulk set of guitars and relevant deliveries and head spin will deliver to Lenny's the purchase price, payable in cash or relevant deliveries and or relevant deliveries. I will have defined what cash means, but in this respect, it's not going to be cash dollars. And so I have my deliveries. Headspin shall deliver to Lenny's a certificate certifying that payment, which shall be attached as Exhibit A to this agreement. At closing, Lenny shall deliver to Headspin a bill of sale. Because it's guitars, okay? It's not like a car. We don't have a title. So there is no other way to transfer ownership other than with a bill of sale. That person's gonna want a bill of sale. <clears throat> okay, so I know now I'm finished with my actions. My next provision is probably going to be some type of a business. Because right now, I don't have any in-game provisions yet. I don't have uh, terminations. I don't have any remedies and identifications. So right now, I got to put my defense identification here in my business because I don't have those provisions yet. So the only other place for me to put it now is here because I know, but I'm not probably, I'm not gonna be looking for y'all to do this, okay? But this is what I'm saying to you. These are business type provisions based on the setup that you have been given to work within. Wherever you, it's properly placed, you have to put it there. If it's not properly placed in one of these other ones, see this, this, once I get my 10 sections, this can't stay here. Because it's a, it's an indemnity provision. But it's a business, it's business is what it's for. Okay, are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. So for our assignments, um, when we are going through the memos and all the facts, and there are provisions that should be in the sections that aren't called for yet, we just include them in the business? No, 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 we, we, do, we do not. Yeah, because we, we're, and you, you, yeah, and you should not, okay. You're gonna have some, but we're not, but that's draft two. Okay. All I'm looking for right now, that's why I just wanna keep it simple. I just want you to focus on what, what we have for this, for, for, for now. Then we're going to talk about those later on. Then that will be assigned for you to then we're gonna add all 10. So I, you know, so you may have a sample that has those. I'm, we're not asking for those, so don't put those because that's not a part of this assignment. We don't, don't focus on termination because we don't even know what it means. <laughs> All right, excellent question. Are there any others at this time? All right, now, so that brings us to the place where we should be, representations and warranties. So after the business class action section, then you go into your representations and warranties, okay? And so we've already talked about what it is. It's a section that contains the premises on which the deal is based. I mean, somebody made a representation, okay? Uh, Ralph is saying, oh, I own this trademark image. Merchandise is saying, oh, I have the financial strength. 
the parties are basing their desire to enter into the agreement with each other based on representations that are being made. Now, I, I you know, this got to be so confusing, this whole idea of this effective date, this as is date. I just, because some people will try to put it in the preamble and then they will think that it's different from the date of the agreement and the, so we don't, but I am telling you there is such a thing. Sometimes people may relate their representations back to an effective date, but you gotta define what the effective date is. It could be that it was some day two weeks ago when Ralph's and merchandisers talk that they want to relate that representation all the way back to that date. Judge, as a, she told me two weeks before we even entered into this agreement, there is a purpose in doing that. I'm just letting you know about that. I, I, I'm not wanting us to deal with, uh, with that for uh, this particular deal, I, I don't, I, I just want us to deal with one date. Okay. <laughs> Cause I have, it's, it's the, for some reason the date is just, it just seems to cause a lot of confusion. So I don't want to see any blanks. The date is what the date is. Okay. But it is important in contracts that the date that the parties sign the agreement, that is critical. That, it, that binds the agreement, okay? And so the date that the parties have you know, signed the agreement, that's the date of the agreement for our purpose. And so again, if a breach of a representation or warranty is discovered after the closing, the agreement may provide for remedies, which we will talk about later because it is so much better to provide for the remedies in the agreement. Everybody knows what's going to happen if you do this, so we won't have to go to court. You may still have to go, but it specifically says in the agreement what the remedy is. So when you do go to court, you just say, Judge, this is what we said. And so a promise, though, to do something in the future is not a representation. We talked about that earlier. So again, it is a uh, concept, but it goes in our representation and warranty section of the agreement. And so we know that we want to make sure that Lenny is not exposed to any liability, including, including breach of warranty, express or implied. All right. So I got to move. All right. And so then I am working on my representations and warranties. And so at some point, uh, I realized that Headspin uh, ha is representing that it has the financial strength to guarantee its payment of the purchase price at the time of closing. But what, ha what happens if that payment comes back non-sufficient funds or whatever the case may be? I may need to have some type of collections. If, but look at this. Now, is this in the proper place? I'm thinking about it right now because now when I start doing my representation of warranties, it occurs to me, oh, well, what if they don't? <laughs> so then I start working on that. And then I may need to, now can this go here? Collections, if payment of the purchase price is returned non-payable for any reason, head spend will become liable for all expenses associated with collection of the purchase price. If that happens, when is that going to have to happen? When is that going to happen, though? If it's returned, it's going to be returned when? After. So this is then a obligation to do something in the future. Can this stay here? No. These are representations and warranties. 
we have learned that you cannot make a promise to do something in the future and that be a representation. So I'm going to have to move that on my puzzle to its proper place. But I'm seeing that I need to, my client has goals. His, we know he's frantic about losing money. So I need to fix that problem. I'm going to fix that with a concept covenant. That's what this is because it can't, it can't, it's not a purpose because it's a promise to do something in the future. All right. So I got to move. All right. And so you have your representation and warranties and then you move on to your conditions and close to your conditions to closing. It is just a final checklist to go back now through your what I call your business. The stuff that's before this to go back through those covenants and representations to make sure that those have been met prior to the parties signing the agreement. That's what the conditions to closing up. Okay, go ahead. Well, they're the business provisions. The they're business not. The closings are the business provisions that go into the action sections? No, they're not no. the business provisions. It's a checklist to make sure that those business provisions have been complied with before the parties sign off on the agreement. That the parties have fulfilled its obligations and covenants. That the representations and warranties were true, were made or true as of the time of closing. That's what you're checking off in your conditions to closing. Now, I have some people who will try to uh, enumerate, like they'll say uh, that, so the, you need one for each. Okay, uh, Lenny shall perform its covenants and obligations. Lenny shall perform only if the following conditions has been satisfied before at the time of closing. That head spins representations and warranties are true at the time of closing. Or that its covenants have been performed. And then you need the flip side for uh, the other part. That's the conditions to closing. That is what it, the conditions, these conditions have to be met prior to signing the agreement. Notice it has nothing to do with closing. Every agreement is gonna have a conditions to closing section because it is a checklist, not just about closing, but to make sure that the parties have met their condition, their covenants and obligations and their representations and warranties at the time that the parties are about to sign the agreement. It has nothing to do with conditions because conditions are concepts. It's a problem solver. It's something that we use throughout the agreement. All right, you all. Okay. All right, so then for the signature, we've already looked at what we need for our signatures, but what I do want to just make sure that I continue, continue, continue to clarify is that it must match. Sometimes I have people who will put Lenny's Music. This name, Lenny's Music Inc., a California corporation, must match exactly the name as identified in the preamble. <coughs> Attention to detail. <coughs> Headspan Records LLC, a California limited liability company, must match the top of that signature block exactly. And 
and then obviously our date should match because I'm breaking it down to the simplest denominator. I'm saying the date that it's signed. All right. So that's the signatures. All right. I want to talk a little bit about your exhibit. So now that I have placed our deliveries, whatever, I have marked my deliveries by exhibit, you should, that should match exactly. You should not be struggling to figure out what exhibit A is because then you're going to go back to your delivery section and say, oh, what's exhibit A? And, and put it here. We're not making exhibits. This is my, like, it's like, this is my exhibit A, but we're not actually making an exhibit A. I'm gonna have my certificate of payment. It may be the credit card slip. Yes, ma'am. Well, you're going to say what it is, it, so, and then you're, uh, I mean, okay. I'll put it here. Let me do an example. So, and it may not be, if there's no closing, then you just say, head spin shall deliver to Lenny's a certificate, uh, of certifying payment of the purchase price, then which shall be attached as Exhibit A. I'm just, or Lenny shall deliver to Headspin a bill of sale reflecting Headspin's payment for and ownership of the guitars. It just, you know, a description of what it is, what the purpose of it is. And then attached here to or attached to this agreement as Exhibit B. So then when I go down here, I should be able to see my same exhibits and it's keeping it in my mind that okay don't forget i need to have exhibits in this agreement oh. well so then you i would need an exhibit b here exhibit a i'm most concerned about my my payment but after this will be exhibit b if that's all the exhibits that are I there have. any other questions about anything that we've covered here